Hello. On behalf of Michigan Radio, I too would like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. As you know, Michigan Radio steadfast, is steadfastly committed to international news. In addition to the extensive news that you hear on the station and programs such as Morning Edition and All Things Considered, we are several programs during the week that help bring world news to Michigan, including BBC News Hour at 9 o'clock in the morning and the world every evening at 7 p.m., in addition to BBC World Service that airs from 10 at night to 5 in the morning. Michigan Radio's partnership with the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan goes back many years and is considered one of the strongest local partnerships of NPR stations and World Affairs Council in the country. It has been a pleasure and a privilege <laughs> to work with <coughs> Excuse me. Executive Director Dixie Anderson, the Board of Directors, and the Lecture Series Committee members over the years. We're very proud of our association and extremely pleased to be a sp an NPR sponsor of this year's Great Decision Foreign Policy Lecture Series. I also want to thank the sponsors, too, for your involvement, and I believe that was Bill and Cecile Faisenfeld of Schuler Books as well. Um, and as well as the Royces, Wolverine Worldwide, and so forth. Um, this evening, uh, we are honored to welcome NPR's national correspondent, Tom Jelton. He brings to his career and to our discussion tonight many years of experience of reporting on international events. During his 27 years at NPR, his award-winning coverage has spanned topics as diverse as, does diverse as wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Colombia, Croatia, Bosnia, and the Gulf War. In addition to his coverage of the Pentagon and Eastern Europe's transition to democracy and capitalism. As a matter of fact, he was reporting from, live from the Pentagon the moment it was hit, September 11th. And he was an NPR lead Pentagon reporter for the war in Afghanistan when it started and the invasion of Iraq. So hopefully Tom will be able to have a calm day here in Grand Rapids tonight. Um, he is author of several books dealing with the journalism, with dealing with journalism and world's affairs, including his most recent, as you can see here, um, which is, provides a unique history of modern Cuba told through the life and times of the Bacardi Rum family. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tom Jelton. Hello everyone. It's just great to be back here. Um, uh, this is indeed my third visit to Western Michigan uh, in association with your World Affairs Councils. And um, I'm not surprised, as Diane said, that, um, that this is a strong partnership. I think it's a natural partnership. And first of all, I'd like to say what a tribute it is to you to be such, uh, such committed supporters of your World Affairs Council. It's a tribute to your interest in international affairs. I wish that communities all across the country uh, showed the same interest and, and concern and thoughtfulness about world affairs and international news as you have demonstrated here over and over again. <clears throat> and as I say, I think it's it's uh, it's natural that 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 this partnership between National Public Radio and the World Affairs Council, not only here but all around the country, uh, uh, has been established. I mean, I, I speak to World Affairs Councils in many cities, and I think that we really have a lot in common. Um, Everyone who supports World Affairs Council activities around the country is demonstrating a, a sort of a citizen's interest uh, in world affairs. And we as a news organization have, I think, uh, exceptionally among news organizations, have demonstrated our commitment to international affairs. You know that if you, if you follow the, the news business, you know that news organizations everywhere are in a period of retrenchment right now. And the one area of coverage that is suffering the most cutbacks is precisely international news coverage. Um, on the other hand, we, even in these recessionary times, are continuing to expand 
our international news coverage. We are alone among all the news organizations in the United States to be expanding our international news coverage right now. We are um, presently about to open a new bureau in Islamabad, uh, indicating you know our concern and our interest in that's where sort of our uh, our security issues are really focused right now. Uh, we're actually opening new, new bureaus while other news organizations are, are closing theirs. We now have 18 foreign bureaus. When I started at NPR, we had uh, one half-time foreign correspondent. He was based or she was based, as the case may be, in London uh, at the BBC. Uh, and it was actually a half-time correspondent and a half-time management position. Uh, and the management side of that person's responsibilities was be to be the liaison between the N NPR and the BBC. And in fact, a great portion of our international news on all things considered back in those days, in the early 80s, actually came from the BBC. We just sort of recycled their reports. And so we had this person at the BBC who was the liaison between NPR and the BBC, and then half of his time he served as a correspondent. Well, we have gone from that half-time position to we now have 30 full-time staff correspondents based around the world. Some, in, we have 18 bureaus, so we actually double up in some bureaus. So we have really, and, and, and this is our claim to fame now among news organizations, is our uh, international news coverage. So uh, as I say, the World Affairs Councils and National Public Radio and all the public radio affiliates around the country really do have a, a natural partnership and I and I would like to uh, take this moment to, to uh, thank the World Affairs Council for working with us uh, over and over again. Um, I'm going to talk about Cuba tonight. Um, I saw somewhere uh, that the title of, of my presentation was going to be Bacardi and the Long Fight for Cuba, Cuba after Castro. Well, these are sort of two, two very different concepts um, because my book is really historical and it goes a long ways back. Cuba after Castro, of course, is looking into the future. Um, but I'm going to try uh, a, a little bit to talk about Cuba after Castro, and I'll certainly address it during the, during the question and answer period. But I do have to tell you this, that I would advise you not to take anything I say about Cuba after Castro all that seriously, because nobody knows what's going to happen uh, once Fidel and Raul Castro ha have departed the scene. This is a, this is a, a, a great mystery. And, and one of the reasons that I think we need to be humble in making any kind of predictions about what's going to happen in Cuba um, is based on the experience of looking at what's happened in Eastern Europe uh, over the past uh, 20 years. Um, we, you know, have sort of reached different conclusions over time about Eastern Europe. The first set of lessons that we had, because I was... I moved to Berlin shortly after the wall came down in 1989, and I covered that whole first initial phase of the transition to democracy and market capitalism in Eastern Europe after the fall of communism. And those of us who were there uh, concluded that the communist system in Eastern Europe was really a house of cards. It just collapsed under its own weight. Uh, you know, once there was any stress, internal, external stress, it just collapsed. We, we learned that there was sort of no uh, popular support for it at all, no uh, no integrity to it all, uh, and and it just collapsed. Well, um, that was a totally legitimate conclusion that we reached, and we were correct in that. However, one of the things that we found as time went by uh, is that people's expectations were not met. Uh, they weren't. They, a lot of people in Eastern Europe in these post-communist societies weren't satisfied with the level of social services that they had. They weren't happy with their governments. Uh, they weren't happy with the amount of inequality that crept into the system. The levels of unemployment, something they had not been uh, accustomed to before. And interestingly enough, in some of the most anti-communist countries people actually voted the communists back in. This happened in Lithuania, uh, for example, a country that had really chafed under, under Soviet rule uh, and was among the most outspoken, uh, the people of Lithuania, and I was there in 1991, were outspoken uh, critics of communism. And yet, after a few years of living under capitalism, they began sort of reaching back and bringing back kind of left-wing governments. So you actually began to see some rethinking, reassessing of what, of, of what kind of system they wanted. Uh, and so 
you know, having initially concluded that communism had no holding power, no staying power, no integrity, uh, we also had to conclude that capitalism really didn't establish itself very firmly there either. And I think that what this experience shows is that the world is very complicated. People are complicated. They make, they make, they have, they make very difficult choices, and it's very hard to sort of predict with certainty uh, what people are going to want. Uh, and it's not a black and white situation. And if there's any story, any place that really exemplifies that, it's Cuba. Cuba is an extremely complicated country. This is one of the reasons that I think that as a correspondent, I'm so obsessed with it. I've now been to Cuba probably about 20 times. And you know what? Every time I come back from Cuba, I sort of am, I feel that I'm more humble. That I, every time I come back, I feel like in, in some way I understand it less. The more I go to Cuba, the more I learn what I don't know. The more I realize how many layers there are to this society. Uh, and I think there's nothing, you know, for a journalist, there is nothing more irresistible than a story that you feel like you can't quite get your arms around. It keeps drawing you back, and you become obsessed with trying to get below the surface and figure out what makes the place tick, which is... Um, uh, uh, the main reason why I decided to take time off from my daily reporting and, and write a book uh, about it. And, and this book, as I say, is largely historical. It really originated in my desire to get kind of a fresh understanding uh, of Cuba. One of the things about Cuba, there are so many books written about Cuba and so many articles written. Um, one of the things that I found is that, is that much of what we read about Cuba is really characterized by cliches. You know, there are about 20 different cliches that you just see over and over again. You, you know, you see there's a whole cliched caricatured picture of what Havana was like in the in the 1950s, in the Meyer Lansky period, in the casinos, and the gambling, and the nightclubs. Uh, you know, another, there's a lot of cliches around Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, these charismatic uh, revolutionaries. Um, you know, there are caricatures and cliches about the Cuban-American community in South Florida and how they're uh, intransigent and, and right-wing and Republican. Um, there's cliches about U.S.-Cuba policy, about how it's kind of stuck in a time warp. And what I wanted to do is sort of just brush aside uh, all these cliches and take a new look at Cuba going way back to the beginning, way back, well, not quite to the beginning, back to the middle of the 19th century. And I wanted to sort of start all over again and, and get a fresh historical uh, understanding of what made Cuba the way it was, the way it is. And I decided, you know, as a, as a journalist, you're always looking for a way to turn something complicated into a story. Make it a story with characters, you know, a narrative, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So I was sort of looking for a way to kind of retell the Cuba story around a cast of characters. I came upon the Bacardi family, sort of stumbled upon the Bacardi family. I didn't, in the beginning, even realize that the Bacardis were a Cuban family, that the Bacardi Rum Company was a Cuban company. Um, but I found in this Bacardi narrative uh, the sort of the perfect vehicle for retelling the Cuba story. Uh, um, I mean, it's a familiar name. It's, you know, fascinating characters. As it turns out, uh, at basically every turning point in Cuban history from the middle of the 19th century on, there was always some little Bacardi angle. There was some Bacardi family member who was either a, a, a witness to great historical events or even a participant in them. Uh, and, and the other thing is, the other thing that appealed to me about the Bacardis is that they, as a family, represent a kind of an element that is often missing in the Cuban narratives, which is that they were an upper class business family. Uh, and you might immediately jump to the conclusion that they were therefore Batista supporters or, you know, part of the you know, the oligarchy in Cuba. But in fact, the Bacardis in Cuba, even though they were uh, from the business class and they, were, uh, and they were very wealthy, were very progressive, very enlightened, very patriotic, supported all sort of the revolutionary patriotic causes in Cuba over the years. So, you know, that they represent in that sense sort of a, a, a kind of an element that is, that is often missing from our understanding uh, of Cuban history. So I decided to... to uh, to sort of tell the Cuba story around the Bacardi example. And I'm just going to take, I have some, I brought some slides uh, with me tonight because I think it, it makes it easier for you to follow the story and I'm going to, I'm going to go briefly uh, through it. Um, 
Um, the one thing that my book is not uh, is it, it's not really a story about rum. It's not even in a sense, I mean, there is a kind of a business narrative here about the Bacardi Rum Company, uh, and, and I'll very quickly sort of explain that. Um, the Bacardi Rum Company was founded in 1862 by a man named Facundo Bacardi, who was a immigrant to Cuba from the Catalonia region of Spain. He came uh, with very humble, um, from a very humble background. He he and his brothers came to, to uh, Cuba. They got into the grocery business. Uh, but he wanted to make something for himself. He wanted to become famous. He wanted to become, I should say, rich. Uh, and he stumbled on the idea of making rum. Now, as it turned out, Cuba in the 19th century, even though it was the largest sugar producer in the world, was not known for its rum. The rum in those days was made mostly in the other Caribbean countries, and it was very dark. It was a very strong rum. It was mostly drunk by men. It was drunk by a lot of sailors. Uh, it was considered a very hearty drink. Um, he recognized that because Cuba had such abundant sugar supplies, and because um, a lot of the molasses that was being used to make sugar was simply being thrown away, he saw an opportunity to build a rum industry in Cuba where it had not existed before. But what was really a, a genius move on his part was that he decided to make a new style of rum. Instead of just producing the kind of heavy, strong spirit that rum makers had made in the past, he came up through a process, he developed a process of filtration and aging uh, and different uh, yeast products. He came up with a, uh, a, a new light rum. And if th those of you who are Bacardi rum drinkers, and I'm not, I have to admit, know that Bacardi rum is clear. It's almost like a vodka. And before that, rum didn't exist like this. He was the one who, who developed this new style of rum that was very light, easy to drink, mixed with fruit juices and sodas. And by, by pioneering this new type of rum, he was able to reach a much broader drinking market. Uh, he was able to, women started drinking rum. Uh, it gave rise, Bacardi rum is what laid the foundation for the age of cocktails in the early part of the 20th century. The daiquiri, the uh, Cuba Libre, the rum and coke, uh, the mojito. These were all cocktails that became, that were first made with Bacardi rum. And that was, as I say, it was a huge commercial success. Bacardi rum went on eventually to become the lead, leading spirits brand in the world. Uh, but it started from very humble origins in this little uh, dirt floored tin roof distillery uh, here. That's the story of Bacardi rum in a nutshell. Uh, I'll get back to it. But um, what I was much more interested in in writing this book is kind of the political uh, part of the story, the connection uh, between the Bacardis and sort of the and the Cuban cause. And the main character in the first half of my book is not Don Facundo, the patriarch, but his son Emilio Bacardi. This is Emilio Bacardi. Uh, he's the first Bacardi born in Cuba. And even though his father grooms him to take over the business, uh, and he, in fact, does become the first president of Bacardi after his father's death, he is torn right from the, be the beginning because he is... Um, a, he is a revolutionary. He is a Cuban patriot. He's the first Bacardi born in Cuba, and he is born at a time when there's this developing spirit of nationalism in Cuba. Cuba in the middle of the 19th century, Emilio was born in 1844, uh, was still a Spanish colony. Uh, it was a very rich colony, and Spain was determined to hold on to Cuba. It had lost basically all of its other colonies in the New World, with the exception of Puerto Rico. It was determined to hold on to Cuba at all costs, and it was very repressive uh, in its rule. And in the middle of the 19th century, we had a whole generation of Cuban patriots who were coming of age, who were uh, strong believers in the idea of a free and independent Cuba. Uh, and Emilio got fell in with this group of revolutionaries like Jose Marti and others. And he sort of was torn, as I say, between his commitment to helping his father establish this new rum business and his involvement uh, in the Cuban revolutionary cause for, for, uh, for independence and freedom. There were two wars fought in Cuba in the 19th century. 
for independence from Spain. The first one lasted 11 years, from 1868 to 1879. <clears throat> it, uh, and it was unsuccessful. Uh, Cuban did not win its independence. Spain continued to rule uh, Cuba. And then in 1895, another war broke out, the second war for Cuban independence. Emilio Bacardi was deeply involved in both wars. Uh, even though he was a businessman, he was sort of serving as an underground leader of the conspiracy in Santiago, the city in eastern Cuba where the Bacardis were from. He was uh, raising funds for the rebels who were fighting up in the mountains. He was collecting weapons. He was acting as an intermediary between the Cuban rebels who were fighting for independence uh, and their uh, external supporters. He eventually, in 1878, was caught uh, by... Uh, Spanish authorities who uncovered what he was doing. He very nearly got executed. Instead, he got sent to Spain, uh, was imprisoned in Spain for four years, comes back to Cuba after that war is over, goes back to his father's business. But then when the second war breaks out in 1895, once again, he becomes involved uh, in, that, uh, in that struggle and actually sends his 19-year-old son, Emilito, off to fight. Now, the interesting thing, one of the reasons that I, I find this interesting is that the Bacardis at this point are a prosperous Cuban family, obviously a white family, but the Cuban Revolution uh, has two aims. The first aim, of course, is independence from Spain, but the second aim is an end to slavery and the establishment of racial equality in Cuba. And the commanding general of the Cuban rebel army in the 1890s was a black general, Antonio Maceo. And Emilio Bacardi knew Antonio Maceo, asked that his son be attached to his unit. So we have here this phenomenon of a prosperous, white, young Cuban uh, soldier fighting under a black general. And this at a time when the United States, of course, is still a racially segregated society. The Cuban independence movement, and I say it's got two aims. One is independence, but the other is establish of, establishment of sort of social and economic and racial justice in Cuba, is at this point far more progressive than any kind of movement of its kind uh, in the United States. And the Bacardis are deeply involved in this struggle. Now, what happens? I'm talking about a war that begins in 1895, the second one. And by 1898, the Cuban rebels uh, are on the verge of victory against Spain. After a, basically a 50-year on and off struggle for freedom, they're on the verge of victory. And what happens? The United States, sectors of the United States, mostly conservative sectors, become alarmed that Cuba is actually going to win its independence because the Cuban rebel army with Antonio Maceo at the top is largely more than 50% a black army. Uh, the population in Cuba is about 50% black. And what we're looking at is the establishment of a free Cuba where blacks and whites have equal rights, equal voting rights, where the population is going to be about 50% black. And the United States, conservatives in the United States, get very nervous about the idea of a, quote, black republic off its shores. There is already Haiti a, um, a few miles away. The United States is very nervous about Haiti. Haiti. So just to kind of oversimplify it a little bit, but not much, the United States intervenes in this war in July of 1898, just when the Cuban rebels are on the verge of victory. The, um, the United States comes in mainly with its navy, defeats the Spanish navy, and U.S. soldiers go ashore in Cuba. There is one battle that U.S. soldiers get involved in on land against the Spanish army. It is the Battle of San Juan Heights in Santiago, the Bacardi's hometown. The Rough Riders uh, are the U.S. fighting force led by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and they defeat the Spanish army in this one battle. There's a na naval battle. The U.S. Navy defeats the, the Spanish Navy. And the United States declares victory. Even though they have come in at the very end of the war, uh, they, they basically declare that, that they have won this war and that Cuba is now theirs because they have defeated the Spanish uh, and they establish a military government uh, in Cuba. And this, of course, is very disappointing to the Cubans who have been fighting for their independence all this time. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a little section uh, where I talk about this in my book. And I'm talking about the hostility that U.S. officers have towards the Cuban rebel army that had been fighting uh, for freedom. 
A large share of the hostility U.S. officers showed toward the Cuban rebels amounted to simple racism. The American units were mostly white, while the Cuban forces were mostly black. To be brief and emphatic, a U.S. Army surgeon from New York told a reporter, they are nothing more or less than a lot of half-breed Cuban niggers. It was inconceivable to many American officers coming from a society that was still racially segregated that black Cubans could be militarily competent or prepared to share political responsibility for their nation. General S.B.M. Young, a division commander, dismissed the Cuban rebels as degenerates and scoffed at the notion that Cuba could be independent. They are no more capable of self-government, he said, than the savages of Africa. So this is the attitude that the United States brings to Cuba. And as I say, uh, the U.S. military establishes uh, a military occupation of Cuba. And Cuba is now no longer under Spanish rule, but it's under U.S. military rule. And the governor of Cuba is General Leonard Wood, an American general. So Emilio Bacardi, um, who has now devoted most of his adult life to the Cuban cause, to the Cuban independence cause, uh, has been imprisoned a second time in Spain. When the war is over, he's released from prison. He goes first to Jamaica to collect his family where they have been in exile. Uh, and I'm going to pick up here with Emilio Bacardi's reaction to the U.S. intervention in the war. In Jamaica, 100 miles across the water, Emilio Bacardi got his news about the situation in Santiago from the local newspapers. They were all published in English, but he did not miss the comments by U.S. commanders belittling the contributions of the Cuban people. After spending 17 months in Spanish prisons for the Cuban cause, when with a son wounded three times in combat against Spanish forces, Emilio was infuriated. He was just as angered by the Americans' arbitrary imposition of authority in Cuba and the dismissal of any governing role for Cubans. When he read of a U.S. edict warning Santiago residents that they would be arrested and forced to do hard labor for 30 days if they did not immediately report the death of someone in their household, Emilio fired off a stinging response. The obligation of those in authority is to be at the service of those who suffer. It is not for those who suffer to be at the disposition of those who command. Emilio and his family returned to Santiago in August 1898. The American flag was by then flying over the city hall, and the town was ruled by a U.S. military governor, Brigadier General Leonard Wood. No sooner had Emilio moved back into his house on Marina Baja Street than old friends began stopping by to air their complaints about the, U the new U.S. administration. After writing his open letter, however, Emilio had calmed down. Cuba was finally free of Spain's suffocating colonial grip. The United States, though temporarily occupying the country, had pledged to abandon Cuban territory at some point and recognize the country's independence, and in the meantime, there was much work to do. This is one of the reasons why I think that Emilio Bacardi uh, is such an appealing character. He is, in his heart, a true Cuban nationalist, a Cuban patriot, and yet um, he, when the United States does occupy Cuba, rather than sit on the sidelines and complain and whine, which is what a lot of the Cuban nationalists did, he said, for better or worse, the United States is here, they're going to occupy uh, Cuba, and we might as well make the best of it. And he decided to have a good, open, working relationship with General Wood. And General Wood, to his credit, recognized in Emilio Bacardi uh, a honest Cuban, a Cuban who was really devoted to the best for his country, uh, and he agreed to make Emilio Bacardi the mayor of Santiago, the first mayor of Santiago. And the two of them did work together, largely around practical things. They expanded uh, education. Uh, they, um, they built up the infrastructure, the United States military, you know, for whatever faults it may have. There's nobody like it in the world in terms of their ability to do practical things. And in, during the four years that the United States occupied Cuba, um, uh, the U.S. military built uh, roads, they built bridges, they built sewer systems. And Emilio Bacardi recognized the good that the United States could do in this, in this, uh, during this time. This is a picture of two, of a, of a, it's the same street. This is a street in Santiago. The top picture is the way it looked before the U.S. intervened in Cuba and took over occupation of the country. The bottom picture shows the improvements that took place under U.S. administration. So <clears throat> Emilio recognizes that the United States is doing some good for Cuba. 
Uh, and as I say, he works uh, with the U.S. administration. Here, Emilio Bacardi is sitting. Uh, they are watching a street cleaning operation in Santiago. Emilio Bacardi is by now an old man. He's sitting there and he's got the white straw hat on the right. This is General Leonard Wood uh, on the left. So uh, that's, a, that's the kind of the background. That's the, the, the attitude that Emilio Bacardi had toward this U.S. occupation. However, there is still this political side. The United States in occupying Cuba uh, insists that black people will not be allowed to have the vote in Cuba uh, in the way that the Cuban rebels had wanted. They thwart the Cubans' attempt to establish their own government. Uh, the United States sort of, the U.S. occupying authority believe that they have a better idea about how Cuba should run uh, uh, its business. And basically every attempt uh, by the Cubans to establish their own governmental institutions is thwarted by the U.S. occupation. The United States does finally leave Cuba in 1902. However, only after insisting that the Cuban Congress uh, enact a provision in their constitution which will give the United States permission to come back to Cuba and reoccupy the country anytime they feel it's necessary. This is the Platt Amendment. So what happens is that just when Cuba has this opportunity finally to achieve independence, it finds that it's unprepared for it. It doesn't have uh, politicians with any experience at running a country because the United States has never really allowed them to uh, get any uh, position of responsibility. It doesn't have any uh, institutions. Emilio Bacardi, after being uh, mayor of Santiago, does go on to become a senator. Uh, but he, like many Cuban called politicians, becomes frustrated uh, that frustrated over the sort of the lack of uh, democratic uh, traditions that Cuba is allowed to establish. Uh, I'm going to read one more uh, section here. Uh, Emilio finally decides to leave the Senate. He's frustrated. He's angry. After years of admiring America, Emilio was coming to the conclusion that the United States, by its sheer size, its expansion, its expansionist impulse, and its instinctive tendency to flex its muscle and dominate its neighbors, inevitably presented a danger to smaller, weaker neighbors. It was not that the United States was especially aggressive. Its behavior was typical of all the big colonial powers of the day. In his commentary, uh, he wrote a commentary about his feelings about this time. Emilio cited the anti-imperialist views of Guglielmo Ferrero, an Italian historian and socialist of that era. Never, not in the past nor today, has any nation governed another people with a spirit of justice, he quoted Ferrero as saying. It is not to stop them from falling that it extends a hand, but rather to push them all the faster toward the bottom of the abyss. The United States had extended a hand to Cuba in 1898, but doomed its development. Emilio returned to this theme in a December 1908 letter to Carlos Garcia, the son of Calixto Garcia, who was a Cuban general who had been spurned by U.S. commanders. In the letter, Emilio referred to the American enemy wise and astute that for many years has been entangling us in the meshes of a preconceived plan. So here we have this character of Emilio Bacardi, who really is a genuine Cuban patriot who has fought for uh, Cuban independence, who worked with the United States, but who in the end becomes very discouraged at the way his country is developing. He gets out of politics altogether, uh, and basically this is kind of a this is kind of a, um, a, sad, uh, a sad chapter uh, in, in Cuban history because uh, the truth is that um, Cuba does not turn into a democracy. Uh, this is basically the end of Bacardi political activism uh, around the Cuban cause because there really is no Cuban cause anymore. Cuba has achieved its independence, but uh, its political institutions are very weak. What happens next? Well, then we get the passage of prohibition in the United States. And Cuba is, all of a sudden, takes on a new role with respect to Americans. Cuba becomes the playground for Americans who want to, a place to go and drink, to carouse, to gamble, to have fun. And starting in about the early 1920s, uh, American tourists flock to Cuba. And, and the sort of the Cuban tourism industry really takes off. And they come to drink. 
And what do they drink when they're in Cuba? They drink Bacardi rum. So now we're entering a sort of a new phase in Cuban history. This is where Bacardi rum really takes off. This is where Americans, this is when Americans discover Bacardi rum. They discover daiquiris, they discover um, all the various cocktails that are made with rum. Uh, and Bacardi becomes a household word. And the Bacardi rum company, the Bacardi family members, have basically gotten out of politics now. Uh, now they're really focused on their business. But they nevertheless do have this pride, this old Cuban pride. It's just that it makes itself, this kind of Bacardi patriotism makes itself manifest in a new way. Instead of fighting politically, they now turn into boosters of Cuba. Uh, and this is a typical advertisement that they ran at that time. Cuba is great. There is a reason, Bacardi. What's interesting about this advertisement is they're not only promoting Bacardi rum, they are, they are promoting Cuba. And this is sort of, as I say, this is the way their patriotism takes on a kind of a new manifestation during this period uh, in the 1920s. There's a there's a uh, advertisement from this period that I found that that really kind of sums it up. There's a, a picture of a uh, a couple uh, seated at an uh, outdoor cafe. It's clearly in France because there's a picture of the Eiffel Tower in in the background, and there's a waiter with a towel over his arm, and he's serving the young couple a, a glass of of Bacardi rum. And the caption to the picture, and of course Cubans like people all over the world saw France at that time as this place of great culture and sophistication, and the, really the fine things came from France. The caption to the to the ad is Bacardi. It doesn't come from France; it goes to France. Uh, and this was sort of the idea that Bacardi's were the Bacardi's were promoting about their rum, that they were putting Cuba on the map through their product. This was this is a scene uh, uh, of Bacardi sales agents from this period, the 1920s. The motto in the background is El que a Cuba ha hecho famosa, the one that made Cuba famous. So we're now seeing sort of this new Bacardi-Cuba connection. The politics are gone. Now it's kind of this boosterism. Uh, and throughout most of the, the 20th century, the Bacardi name in Cuba became really associated with the Cuban soul, the Cuban spirit. Um, the uh, Bacardi rum was the main, sp there are two things that are really important to Cubans, baseball and music. And Bacardi rum was the main corporate patron of Cuban baseball, when, when Cuban baseball was finally broadcast on television, it was sponsored by Bacardi Rum. And music, Cubans during this period heard most of their music on the radio. And who was the, the corporate sponsor every night of, a, of, of Cuban music on the radio was Bacardi. There was a program every night called Party with Bacardi, Fiesta con Bacardi. Uh, and so the Bacardis during this period are associating themselves with Cuba, with everything that is known about Cuba in this very tight way. Uh, and this continues on up into the 1950s. Who's Cuba's most famous sort of foreign resident at this point? Ernest Hemingway. In 1955, Ernest Hemingway wins uh, a Nobel Prize. Who is the company that, that throws the party to celebrate Hemingway's winning the Nobel Prize? It's Bacardi. This is a picture from this. So. This is sort of the, the new manifestation of this Bacardi-Cuba connection. Now, in the meantime, what has happened politically in Cuba? Well, as I said, uh, the, what, what really put Cuba on the map in the 1920s was prohibition, tourism, gambling. And as you can imagine, with this sort of influx of tourism and, and gambling on the one hand, and the weak political institutions that Cuba had at that point on the other hand, what you get is increasing corruption. You get dictatorship, you get the organized crime, uh, getting a foothold in Cuba, and by the 1940s, sort of the new Cuban cause, no longer independence, no longer fighting Spain, no longer fighting the United States, the new Cuban cause uh, by the 1940s is fighting their own dictators. First Gerardo Machado in the 1920s and 30s, then Batista uh, in the 40s, and, um, and at this point, a Bacardi family member re-enters the picture. This is Pepin Bosch. He married the granddaughter of the founder, Don Facundo. His wife is Emilio's niece. Now, often Bacardi uh, in-laws take leadership roles in the company during this period. But at any rate, Pepin Bosch uh, 
along with Bacar uh, Emilio Bacardi, is the other main character in my book. So he emerges, he takes charge of Bacardi rum in the 1940s, and very quickly he establishes a, a, a reputation in Cuba as the most honest businessman on the island. He is known for his strong stand against corruption. He's outspoken. He refuses to pay bribes to the government inspectors that come around. Bacardi Rum, by this point, becomes the most famous Cuban company on the island. Pepin Bosch is the leading Cuban businessman. And in 1949, uh, the president of Cuba, Carlos Prio, who's the man on the left, asks Pepin Bosch to be his finance minister. But, uh, Carlos Prio has run on a platform of getting rid of corruption in Cuba. And who is the best symbol of honesty and integrity in Cuba but Pepin Bosch. So Pepin Bosch comes into the government and he becomes finance minister and in two years uh, really cleans up sort of the whole tax apparatus uh, in Cuba and really reassociates the Bacardi name with good government and patriotism uh, in Cuba. But what happens? 1952, uh, Fulgencio Batista overthrows Carlos Prio in a military coup. Uh, Pepin Bosch, as somebody who has opposed dictatorships all his life and sort of as the, uh, the heir to this Bacardi reputation, becomes furious with this military coup because it had seemed finally that Cuba was on the path to democracy and it is derailed by this military coup. So Pepin Bosch at this point becomes the sort of the leading Cuban to take a strong stand against Batista. And in May of 1952, just three months after Batista has taken power in this military coup, Cuba has the 50th anniversary of its revolution. This is the Bacardi building in downtown Havana. And Pepin Bosch orders the Cuban flag to be t hung the entire front length of the building as a kind of a defiance uh, against Batista. Well, in the 1950s, you know this story. Uh, Batista is the dictator of Cuba, and uh, gradually a revolutionary, a new revolutionary movement gets established in Cuba under the leadership of Fidel Castro. And uh, they, they first, they, they come in 1953. They try to overthrow an army barracks. They get put in prison. He comes back in 1956. He goes in the mountains, and he's organizing this guerrilla uprising against the Batista, Batista uh, dictatorship. Who is Fidel Castro's leading supporter within the Cuban bourgeoisie? Pepin Bosch, president of Bacardi Rum Company, and the Bacardi family members. They throw their lot in with Fidel Castro. And they say, this is the revolution that we need. Pepin Bosch personally donates out of his own pocket about $75,000 to Fidel Castro. This would be, if you measured in today's dollars, would be around $300,000 of his own money that he gives to Fidel. Other Bacardi family members do. Uh, and the Bacardis now have this reputation for being Fidel's closest allies within the business class. In January 1959, uh, Fidel Castro takes power in Cuba. Pepin Bosch, the president of the company, goes to the new government on January 22nd, three weeks after Fidel Castro takes power, with a check for $450,000, which is their estimate of how much they think they're going to owe in business taxes for the coming year. Pepin Bosch voluntarily pays their income taxes a year in advance because he wants Fidel Castro's government, and Batista has robbed the treasury uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, a lot of money. Uh, Pepin Bosch and the Bacardis want Fidel Castro to get on a sound footing. In April 1959, uh, Fidel Castro takes his one and only trip to the United States, and he picks one Cuban businessman to go with him as his sort of, as a representative of his dedication to the business class. And who is the one Cuban businessman that he decides to take with him, that he invites to go with him? It's Pepin Bosch, president of the Bacardi Rum Company. Uh, and I just have a paragraph here, a couple of paragraphs where I'm, where I'm talking about this, this trip to Washington. On the flight to Washington, Castro moved up and down the aisle, chatting with members of the delegation. When he came to Pepin Bosch, Castro squatted on the floor next to him like a pupil facing his teacher. It was the first encounter of these two brilliant personalities, each utterly confident in his own judgment, but uncertain of the other. Senor Bosch, Castro said, tell me what you think we can do for the economy in Cuba. 
The unkempt guerrilla leader was showing as much deference as he could manage before the short, short bald businessman in the natty three-piece suit. Bosch, who was old enough to be Fidel's father, looked down at him with his famously icy smile. Well, consider our resources, he said in his soft, high-pitched voice. We have iron, we have nickel, we have manganese, we have cobalt, and we have the Hanabania, which was a large hydroelectric plant then under construction. Bosch had long been a proponent of hydroelectric power in Cuba, and he'd worked hard in the previous years to promote the dam building project. So we could certainly make steel, and we could even become a high-quality producer. It was clearly an idea that appealed to Castro, who had argued often in favor of ending Cuba's dependence on sugar production. His eyes widened. Do you think we can produce more than the United States? <laughs> he asked. Bosch was stunned by the question for its obvious naivete and for what it revealed about Castro's U.S. obsession. Of course not, Fidel. Whatever are you talking about? So we have this, uh, but Bosch has been supporting the Castro's movement, but now that Castro is in power, you know, Bosch begins to wonder, this guy, you know, I have, to, I have to wonder about him a little bit. He seems to have this obsession with the United States. Where is he really coming from? And where does he really intend to take Cuba? Well, uh, you know the rest of the story. Uh, in 1960, October 1960, a year and a half, a year and ten months after taking power, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara uh, expropriate all private business in Cuba, including the Bacardi Rum uh, Company. The Bacardis go into, into exile, and you can imagine what happens. Having been so outspoken in support of Fidel Castro during this long period when a lot of people were skeptical of him, including a lot of people in the United States, suddenly they find themselves looking like fools for having trusted him. They go into exile. They have managed to reorganize their company with new facilities in Mexico and Brazil and, and uh, Puerto Rico. So they're able to stay in business. Uh, they've lost their, their headquarters in Cuba and they've lost all their homes in Cuba, of course. Um, now, the Bacardis in exile go from being uh, Fidel Castro's best friend to being his worst enemy. And all of this old tradition of Bacardi political activism becomes refocused. Instead of supporting the Cuban Revolution, instead of supporting the fight against Spain, it's now focused on one thing, getting rid of Fidel Castro. They feel that Fidel Castro has really betrayed the country, betrayed the cause with which they've been associated with for a long time. And Pepin Bosch himself takes the lead uh, in directing a lot of anti-Castro activities. Um, Here's Fidel Castro in the old Bacardi rum facility in Santiago after he has uh, expropriated it. Well, Pepin Bosch, in exile, decides he's going to get rid of Fidel Castro himself. He actually buys this airplane, which is a B-26 uh, invader, uh, has it outfitted with bombs, and he's going to he's going to find a pilot to fly it back to Cuba and bomb the oil refineries in Cuba with this idea that it sort of is going to spark an uprising. Uh, it's kind of a harebrained idea. Uh, Pepin Bosch has always been a maverick operator. He doesn't like to work with the CIA. He doesn't like to work with other groups. He likes to be on his own. This is a uh, he never is able to find anyone willing to undertake this mission, so it doesn't go anywhere, as you can imagine. Uh, but this is indicative of the energy that Pepin brings, Pepin Bosch brings to this cause. Um, and then at some point he gives up on sort of overthrowing uh, Fidel militarily, and instead the Bacardis and Pepin Bosch begin working politically to undermine uh, uh, Castro's rule. And Bacardi money and, and Pepin Bosch himself found something called the Cuban American National Foundation, which by the 1980s becomes the leading exile uh, voice in the United States working against Fidel Castro. Uh, this man on the right is Jorge Mascanosa. He's obviously with President Reagan. The Cuban American National Foundation is well known as the leading exile voice. What people don't realize is that it was founded largely by Bacardi money. So we now see this story of the Bacardi's sort of taking, going full circle from being revolutionaries in the 19th century to being supporters of Fidel Castro, now being determined to overthrow him. What happens next? Well, in, now we get into the period where we're beginning to see the end of the story. In, back in Cuba, the old Bacardi Rum Company has been taken over by the Cuban government. Uh, this is the picture of the old Bacardi warehouse. This is rum. And a lot of the workers who made Bacardi rum in the old days actually stayed with the company, and it became, actually, they, they made good rum. 
And in 1993, uh, when Cuba lost its Soviet aid uh, and had to sort of reach out to the West to survive, uh, for the first time, joint ventures were allowed in Cuba. And Pernod Ricard, a big French company, comes into Cuba and establishes a joint venture with the Cuban government to produce and distribute Cuban rum, socialist rum, rum made in Cuba, but rum that's actually very good quality. It's now called Havana Club, uh, and it becomes world famous. And this is a cocktail competition from about 2004. Uh, bartenders from all over the world have come to Cuba to make Havana Club cocktails. This is, you know, there's a lot about Cuba these days that is really a disaster, but the rum industry is a bright spot. And this is the one way where you can actually begin to look at the future of Cuba. Because the one, as I said at the beginning, we don't know what Cuba is going to look like in the post-Castro period. But one of the things we do know for certain is that the rum industry in Cuba is going to be a bright spot and Havana Club rum Havana Club rum made in Cuba is now the fastest growing spirit in the United States. And we are already beginning to see an example of the kind of fights that are going to be taking place in post-Castro period around this issue of who's going to get control of the rum industry. This is where the Bacardis come back into the picture because they look at Havana Club and Pernod Ricard, which is an old rival of theirs. They see them having this tremendous commercial success selling Cuban rum. Uh, and they begin to worry that in the post-Castro period, this French company, Pernod Ricard, is going to be there on the ground floor and is going to take over the Cuban rum business. So Bacardi begins to sort of try to, um, through a, a variety of very complicated legal and trademark battles, tries to thwart Pernod Ricard's attempt to take over the Cuban rum industry. Um, I could go on at this at some length, but basically my premise is that we see right now in this battle over the control of Cuban rum some glimpse of what the future of Cuba is going to be like. We're going to have foreign companies like Pernod Ricard trying to get back in there on the ground floor. We're going to have the Cuban government or what remains of it um, defending one of the few industries that is worth defending and we're going to have exile money like the Bacardis coming back to Cuba to sort of pick up where they left off. It won't be an easy thing. This is the Bacardi Rum Company as it appears today. This is the old Bacardi Rum Company in Santiago. These horse-drawn buggies here are not for tourists. Those are taxis. That gives you an example, that gives you an idea of the sort of the state of infrastructure development in Cuba today. Cuba is a very poor country uh, and it's not going to be possible for any Cuban exile family to go back there and easily reestablish themselves given the poverty. Um, and given the lack of infrastructure, uh, the lack of, the, of electrical grid, of roads, basically the, the infrastructure that we see in Cuba today is the same one that the United States uh, uh, built in the, at the beginning of the century. So that's my Bacardi story. I've had to kind of skim through it uh, quickly at the end. There are a couple lessons, uh, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. There are a couple of lessons I think that this Cuba narrative shows. One is, and this is important, the United States bears heavy responsibility for what's happened in Cuba over the last hundred years. Cuba was headed uh, on more than one occasion toward democracy and U.S. intervention, U.S. fears of what a democratic Cuba might actually do, what profile it would have in the hemisphere, thwarted Cuba's uh, development of democracy. The second point that is important to keep in mind is that Cuban nationalism, Cuban patriotism, is not only synonymous with Fidel Castro. One of the reasons the Cuban exiles feel so strongly uh, about uh, what's happening in Cuba is because many of them are Cuban nationalists. They look back to the fights that they were involved with earlier. They consider themselves to this day Cuban patriots. And so it's wrong to sort of limit our understanding of Cuban nationalism to those Cubans who are allied with the government. You can also see Cuban nationalism on display in South Florida. Uh, the Cuban exiles who make the no most noise are not simply a bunch of right-wing fat cats. Some of them are true Cuban patriots. On the other hand, Cuba has changed in the last 50 years, and it's unrealistic to think you can sort of dial the clock back to where it was in 1959. A lot of the people, for example, who are involved in the rum industry today are very proud that they were able to keep this rum industry going for 50 years and to turn it into a commercial success. And they are going to resist 
people like the Bacardis coming back and trying to retake the rum industry. So totally aside from the ideological question of what ideology Cubans choose in the future, there are going to be Cubans that will fight very hard to defend the things that they have accomplished. That's my sort of 45 minute view of Cuban history. I've gone a couple minutes over, but we do have about 20 minutes here for, for questions and I'd be delighted to take them. Can you speak a little bit about segregation in Cuba today or integration in Cuba today? Where, where are the black Cubans? <coughs> well, the Afro-Cuban population today is, did everybody hear the question? The, the Afro-Cuban population today is probably about 50%. Um, you know, one of the things about, about the population in Cuba is that there's been a lot more uh, intermarriage than when we've, we've seen in the United States and therefore sort of the color lines are much much more vague there's a sort of a whole continuum and, and racial identity is a very continuous thing um, but I think you could say that about 50 percent of the population uh, considers itself Afro-Cuban and after you know during this period when the mafia was in control of Cuba and sort of U.S. money interests were in charge in Cuba, you know, you didn't see the same progress toward integration that you saw in the 19th century during the revolutionary period. And actually there was segregation. It was never as harsh as in the United States, but there was segregation. And this was one of the objectives of the Fidel Castro's revolution to put an end to it. And a lot of, of de jure segregation, legal segregation was abolished. Uh, and there were great strides made by the Afro-Cuban population in Cuba uh, during this period. And the truth is that today, you see, you see more support for Fidel Castro among the Afro-Cuban side of the population than you do for the white side of the population. Partly this is because most of the exiles who left Cuba were white. And to the extent they have now been sending money back to Cuba, they sent it back to their relatives. And so the white population in Cuba tends to get a disproportionate share of those remittances coming from Florida, whereas the Afro-Cubans have a, a lot less resources coming from outside. And this has introduced some new tensions in Cuba that weren't there before. On the other hand, if you look at the, the, if you look at the Cuban structure of the Cuban government, it's almost entirely white. Even though the population is about 50% black, you know, the people around Fidel Castro are almost entirely white. So there still is uh, and, and I think that you know Cubans will tell you this. There still is a significant amount of racial prejudice in Cuba to this day. Um, I have the mic over here. Okay, we're here. <laughs> we're here. There we are. Uh, I, I happen to be one of those black Cubans that left Cuba. Okay. I was a nine-year-old when when we left Cuba. Yeah. Uh, however, I did not experience prejudice in Cuba as, as, as much as I saw it here right. at, at the very beginning. I cannot complain. Uh, United States has been great to me, but I saw it more here as I was coming into Miami than I, you know, what I experienced in Cuba. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the trip that Pepin uh, and Castro made into the United States? Yeah. What was the purpose of that trip? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, this is April 1959, and the United States at this point was still trying to decide what to make of Fidel. They weren't sure. Uh, there were a lot of uh, skeptics. President Eisenhower chose not to meet with Fidel on that visit. He met with Vice President Nixon instead. Uh, and um, Fidel at that point, uh, he was on Meet the Press. He actually spoke English. He said he was going to have, there's nothing to worry about. He said he was going to have free elections. He actually gave a speech at Harvard on that trip where he gave a very eloquent criticism of communism. He said, um, we have just been through a system that offers people freedom but does not offer them bread. And we rejected that. 
communism, on the other hand, offers people bread, but it does not offer them freedom. We want to have both. We want to have freedom to eat, and we want to have freedom to think freely. So he gave a very cogent criticism uh, of communism on that trip, and actually a lot of people were convinced. And even though Pepin Bosch was beginning to have second thoughts about Fidel, when he came back to Cuba, he continued to say, this is a man we can work with. So, um, you know, there were some sort of, what some people would say, warning signs uh, coming from some of the things that Fidel said at that point, but he was still sort of appearing to want to have a good relationship with the United States. The United States was still thinking about having a good relationship with, with Fidel. It wasn't for another year before the two sides really broke, but that was sort of the the one brief moment when it appeared there might be some kind of rapprochement between Fidel Castro and the United States. Yes, sir. Well, there were um, economic sanctions that were put on the Cubans beginning in the 1960s. Correct. And yet you say that the Havana rum is one of the fastest, largest, or selling rums in the United States. If that's the case, why can't we get a good Cuban cigar here? <laughs> well, you know what? The U.S. rum market is 50% of the world rum market. 50% of the rum sold in the world is sold in the United States. Havana Club rum, made as a joint venture between Pernod Ricard and the Cuban government, uh, is selling somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four million cases a year right now. And as I said, it is the fastest growing single spirits brand uh, in the world. Although it's way below Bacardi. Bacardi sells somewhere around 18 million cases a year. So it's way below Bacardi. But imagine if they had access to the US rum market. You'd have to assume that their sales would at least double. So they have achieved that growth without access to the US rum market. Uh, and, you know, people that go to Cuba sometimes bring back some Havana Club rum, but, you know, you, uh, you have to, you're running the risk of having it confiscated uh, by customs. And the same thing with Cuban cigars. Cuban cigars are, you know, I mentioned the Cuban rum industry is one of the few bright spots uh, in Cuba today. The tobacco industry is obviously another example. And just as there's certain to be a real fight over control of the Cuban rum industry in the future, there's going to be fight over the... Uh, tobacco industry as well. But, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe you will be drinking Havana Club rum here in Grand Rapids here in a few years. You, sir. What's what's going to be the U.S. diplomatic posture as we look at it uh, from the executive branch point of view? Well, the last words there from the executive branch point of view is very important because Starting in 1996, the trade embargo was no longer uh, an executive order. It became the law of the land. It was enshrined in legislation. So you're not going to see an end to the Cuban embargo, the Cuban trade embargo, until Congress passes a law nullifying it. Uh, there's only so much that the executive branch can do with respect to U.S.-Cuba policy. However, there are a few things. Um, we saw a, a major shift in U.S. Cuba policy from the Clinton years to the Bush years. Uh, during the Clinton administration, there was a very uh, flexible attitude towards people-to-people -to -people, uh, exchanges in Cuba. It was, you still couldn't get on a plane and fly there as a tourist, but, you know, if you wanted to go to Cuba, you could. All you had to do was sign up for a study tour or some kind of exchange visit, and those were basically open to anyone who wanted to do it. You would have to say, you know, there would be some, let's say, some music institute that was uh, sponsoring a tour to Cuba that was going to focus on Cuban jazz, or maybe a, a study group that was going to focus on Cuban architecture. You sign up for one of these study groups, that was a way to get to Cuba. Now, that, that type of policy could be reinstituted. Uh, under this administration, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if that, in fact, happens uh, within a couple of years. We do know from what Barack Obama has said already that there will be two changes taking place very soon. One is going to be lifting the restriction on how much money Cuban Americans can send back to their families in Cuba. This was limited to $300 every three months under President Bush. Uh, uh, President Obama said he's going to lift that completely. Uh, the Bush administration also, Cuban Americans have always been an exception to the travel ban, uh, 
but under the Bush administration, they were told they could only go back once every um, once every three years. Uh, and that is something else that the Obama administration can change, and he has said he will change. So we're going to see some small changes in the beginning. We might see some bigger changes later on, but the embargo is not going to be changed until Congress votes to nullify it. Yes, okay, no. Um, given uh, that things will eventually change, what opportunities do you see for U.S. businesses and do you see U.S. companies poising themselves to get in on some of that action that you're talking about in Cuba? Well, it's, um, it's very hard uh, for, Cuban, for American businesses to do that with two really important exceptions. One is agriculture. Uh, and two is medical products. Right now, uh, U.S. agricultural producers can sell to Cuba, and they have moved very aggressively to take advantage of that market because they see it as a, a very important market. Uh, I don't know whether you've had any Michigan farm groups uh, going to Cuba, but uh, throughout the Midwest, you've seen farmers groups uh, organizing trade delegations to Cuba, and there will there will be, it's still difficult because under U.S. law they have to get paid, the Cuban government has to pay in cash for its purchase of U.S. agricultural products in advance of their, of their delivery. So this is a very onerous requirement. You could see that if, if that requirement were lifted and if the Cubans could actually purchase U.S. products on a credit basis, uh, which is the way other importers can, you would see a real explosive growth in U.S. agricultural sales to Cuba. Already there is significant, in fact, Cuba imports more of its food from the United States than from any other country. So already you see that aspect of trade to Cuba getting established. Same thing with uh, medical supplies and medical equipment. Um, now, in other areas, I think it's going to be hard. I think tourism, the tourism infrastructure in Cuba is already totally dominated by European Canadian tourism companies and I think it's going to be hard for American companies to come in and get to do much in the area of, of tourism um, the most profitable ventures in Cuba have already been sort of taken over by non-US uh, I mentioned the French company involved with rum there's uh, another big industry in Cuba is nickel there's a big Canadian company share it which is now a, in a joint venture to produce nickel so I do think in some of these other areas it's actually going to be very hard for US companies to get in and start doing business Excuse yes sir uh, finally thank you. Uh, can you comment on the continued support of the Cuban community for the embargo I understand that there are some splits in that yeah, um, you know, the, 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 as I said before, the sort of the famous intransigence, uh, the alleged intransigence of the Cuban-American community towards Fidel Castro really arises out of this deep sense of bitterness uh, and anger. Uh, and I think you can even say it sort of goes beyond, I hate to say it's irrational, but it is certainly fueled by emotion as much as by reason. And as that generation of Cubans who felt that they were pushed out of the country unfairly. As they become less dominating a part of the Cuban exile community, as the younger generation comes up, it's going to be, you know, the issue of U.S. Cuban policy is less emotional to them. And they're able to look at it in sort of a calm way. And not surprisingly, you're seeing support for the embargo uh, diminishing year by year. Um, it's a very hard thing to poll because like all polls, it depends on how the question is phrased. However, uh, there have been some recent polls that suggest that close to 50% of the Cuban American community right now uh, is actually in favor of lifting the embargo, at least in, in some ways. So I think that you know, once you see that tendency become more dominant, that's when you're going to see the politics around this issue really shifting. Um, uh, over the years, um, the Amer you know, United States has placed sanctions uh, against Cuban, and the Cuban embargo has um, taken root. Um, could you please talk a little bit about how this may or may have not have formed um, certain opinions that the Cuban uh, population had had towards Americans and how they viewed Americans overall um, and the relationship that we've had back and forth? Well, you're going to have a very hard time, in my opinion. I've been to Cuba a lot, and I do speak Spanish, and I'm able to talk to Cubans. I think you'd have a very hard time finding 
very many Cubans who would say, we understand why you have an embargo against this and we think it's a good idea. Uh, because, you know, I mean, they want to they want to see Americans. They want to have Americans visiting their, their island. You know, regardless of how they feel about Fidel Castro, they want to have closer ties to the United States. They want to be able to buy U.S. products. The, even, the, even those, you know, it's interesting. I, um, um, I met some young Cubans who had been dissidents uh, in Cuba and actually uh, were imprisoned and had to flee the island eventually. I met them in, in, in Miami, and they had both worked in the sugar industry, and I found, to my surprise, that they were really proud of Cuban rum. Uh, and, it's, you know, and, and, and I found Cubans who are bitter foes of Fidel Castro take great pride in their baseball team or in their musical uh, accomplishments. So, you know, patriotism is separated from ideology. That's one of the things that I have learned. And Cubans, even Cubans who are bitter enemies of Fidel Castro, still a lot of them have pride in their country. And they don't like this idea that the United States is refusing to do any kind of business with them. So there's not really much popular support, in my opinion, in Cuba uh, for the embargo. And on the contrary, there's a real enthusiasm for better ties with the United States. In my judgment, if I were to make, um, if I were to make a policy recommendation to the Obama administration with respect to Cuba, I think the extent to which Barack Obama can speak directly to the Cuban people, um, you know, work out some kind of deal where he's able to make a televised you know, speech to the Cuban people in which instead of sort of filling it with all kinds of partisan stuff about freedom and democracy, just to sort of make a friendly speech to the Cuban people saying, you know, we want to reestablish the kind of relationship we used to have, this would be such a powerful message. I mean, I think there's a real eagerness there for closer ties to the United States. And, you know, if we could just sort of cool off the rhetoric a little bit, I think, uh, you know, aside from lifting the embargo and all these political things, I just think if you could have a little bit of an outreach to the Cuban people, it would really make a big difference. Yes, sir. You spoke a lot about uh, the United States and Cuba, their yes. relationship, which makes sense. What about on a wider uh, international scope? I mean, is Russia going to become a player again? What about Venezuela? Um, you hear rumors about people talking to Venezuela, talking to Iran, talking to Cuba, talking to whoever. Um, is, is that just a, a little whisper that is untrue? Or, or that well, what's going on with Russia right now is there's a real determination around the world to sort of, to sort of goad the United States. And it's part of this new Russian sense of um, it's kind of an aggressiveness. It's kind of Russia is back. Uh, we're, not, we're going to reestablish our position in the world as a serious major world power. And we are tired of sort of being second class, viewed as second, a second class nation. There's a real sense that the United States has, for the, since the end of the Cold War, has been this one dominating superpower in the world. And so Russia is really trying to take the United States down a notch. And the Russians never miss an opportunity to sort of stick it to us a little bit in that sense. And it's in that context that I would sort of place this Russian overture to Cuba. They're really not interested. I mean, Cuba is a very needy country. Russia is not interested in going back there and reestablishing a, you know, a, a, a relationship of, of patronage uh, to Cuba or trade subsidies. You know, and the Cubans aren't really able to m buy much from Russia, and Russia's not inclined to give them a lot of grants. So a lot of this, of the lot in Raul Castro was just in Moscow, and and uh, Medvedev was in was in Havana not very long ago. A lot of this is for show. It's really there's not a lot b below the surface. Venezuela, on the other hand, is a very different story. Uh, Venezuela, Hugo Chavez really feels that he has a stake in the Castro regime surviving, and so. Venezuela has been heavily subsidizing Cuba with oil. Uh, and that is extremely important uh, to Cuba's survival. And it is one of the reasons why, you know, I talked about the liberalization in the 1990s when Cuba first started to allow foreign companies to come in and establish joint ventures. That actually, in the beginning of, the, of this century, in the early 2000, 2001, 2002 period, really dropped off. Foreign investment in Cuba has really dropped off. And it's because 
the Venezuelans came to the rescue and Fidel had made clear he didn't really like foreign investment. And once the Venezuelans came to the rescue, he said, all right, we don't need those Western capitalists anymore. And he made it much more difficult for them to, to, to do business in Cuba. So very different story between Venezuela and Russia. The third country that's really important right now is China. China has entered into a lot of uh, commercial agreements uh, in Cuba. But China takes a very non-ideological view of this. China looks at its interest in, in, in Cuba very much like it does the rest of Latin America and Africa. It's looking for resources. It's looking for good deals. It doesn't care about human rights or politics or anything like this. And, Cuba, and, and China sees you know, the possibility of oil fields offshore Cuba. It sees you know, some undeveloped potential there, and, and China is really eager to do some very aggressive investing. But it's not ideological, it's not political, it's not meant to sort of establish a kind of a, uh, you know, a base offshore of the United States. It's very commercial, commercial. So you've got three very different examples between Russia, Venezuela, and China. In the beginning, you opened up your um, commentary saying, uh, noting how the Eastern Bloc countries kind of imploded because of lack of infrastructure, lack of um, support to the government. And right. we see some of those same um, elements there in Cuba right now. You also have a, the brother stepping in, Raul stepping in, um, a transition to take place sometime soon. Um, do you see a similar uh, type or an opportunity for a similar type of implosion of the current government there? And if U.S. opened up um, commercial markets there, is there a way for it to help Cuba avoid political instability that might otherwise open up? That's a very good question. And I think... Um, I think that there are some commonalities between what we saw in Eastern Europe and Cuba. I think <clears throat> in Cuba there are a lot of people that sort of pretend to support the government who really don't believe in the system and sort of just go through the motions. <clears throat> I have a friend, I have to be careful not to identify him, but he's a journalist in Cuba and he writes news bulletins, he writes the international news bulletins that you hear in Cuban radio and television a lot. And he writes these news bulletins that are just full of vitriol towards the United States. Uh, and they represent the sort of the Cuban line. And yet, you know, he actually at one point even tried to come to the United States and get a job with Radio Marti, which is the voice of the exiles. I mean, he doesn't believe anything that he says. He doesn't believe anything that he writes. And it's just, they, the Cubans have a word for it. It's called doble cara, double face. You know, they have sort of a two-faced attitude. You know, on the one hand, and, and if I, I'll tell you what, if I go in the streets of Cuba with my microphone and I say, what do you think of Fidel Castro? You know, they're going to say, you know, what a great hero he is and he's their leader and so forth. When you get to know them privately, they're a lot, you know, they tend to be much more cynical. So that, I think, Cuba has in common with the Eastern Europe of, you know, those systems were a house of cards. And as I say, they just sort of fell under their own weight in the end because it turned out nobody really believed that stuff. And I think to an extent that's true in Cuba. However, remember the other part of the Eastern Europe story was that as people realized that capitalism was not quite, you know, the be all and end all that they may have thought it was. I mean, they believed, they, they got to the point where they didn't believe anything the government told them and therefore, you know, if the government says capitalism is bad, it must be good. And then when they actually experience capitalism and market economics, they find out that there are, you know, it brings unemployment, there are winners and losers, you know, social services aren't so good, health delivery maybe goes down, and gradually they start saying, well, maybe we want a mix of the two. Now, Cubans have, have looked at what's happened in Eastern Europe over the last 10 years, and I think that if there were a transition now in Cuba, it would look different than what we saw in Eastern Europe. I think Cubans would probably opt right from the start for more of a mixed kind of model. You know, I know a lot of Cuban immigrants that come to the United States and right off the bat they're very angry about the healthcare system here. They, they didn't realize that you couldn't just walk into a clinic and get treated for free with no questions asked. They've been, you know, they sort of assume that the whole world is like that. And they come to the United States and they find out it's not. So I, I do think that if you did see a transition in Cuba, it wouldn't be this kind of black and white transition that we saw in 1989 in uh, Eastern Europe. Dixie. I think that it's probably 
for your book signing. Okay. So why don't I ask, uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Dalma come up. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Tom Jelton.